Hi there, I'm Andrea Koppel, and it's time for Coffee, the podcast where you get to hear firsthand what the jobs and careers that interest you the most are really like. Hey there, Java junkies. Welcome back to another episode of T4C. If you're interested in learning more about what it's like to work in construction or real estate, then this is the episode for you. Because my next guest is a super successful young businessman with more than 20 years of experience in construction and real estate. But before I introduce you to MK El Kamisi, I want to make sure you've signed up for the Java Junkies Journal. That's T4C's weekly newsletter that comes out on Mondays, and it's got unique insights into dozens of different industries from the professionals who actually work in them. Just head over to the Time for Coffee website at time, the number four, coffee.org, and the sign up box is right there. Now, my Java lovers, please grab your mug and take a chug of your favorite caffeinated brew because it's time for another caffeinated career conversation. And my guest is Mohammed El Kamasi, also known as MK, who has been working in the Persian Gulf since 2013. MK is currently living in Qatar where he's working as the general manager of operations at one of the leading construction contracting groups in the Middle East. They have a turnover of over $650 million a year. MK's career began while he was still a teenager. He was training for years and years and years to become a professional soccer player. And when that dream wasn't realized, he pivoted into the real estate industry while he was still in college. But graduating, as he did, around September 11, 2001, with the first name Mohammed, meant that despite his experience, despite his degree, no one would even look at his resume. Eventually, MK got a break working in a low-income housing project, and before long, he became a managing partner in one of the leading real estate consulting practices in Atlanta, Georgia. In recent years, MK has become an angel investor in startups all over the world. MK, welcome to Time for Coffee. Just how caffeinated are you and ready to go? Very, always. Well, I am thrilled to hear that. What kind of coffee do you like? I'm Hoping you're going to say Arabic coffee because that's one of my favorites. Yes, I do. Uh, but mainly cold. So like, I, I love the cold espressos. You love the cold espressos? Yes. Oh, my God. Love it. Well, of course, because how hot is it there right now? Not too bad. It's, it's 35, to, uh, 35 Celsius, which is not, not bad. The summer here, the summer that just finished was... We're looking at 120 as an average. So I'm very happy, man, to be down to 120 degrees. I'm sorry, Mm -hmm. you were looking at 120 degrees as the average. Yes, in the summer, yeah, definitely. Oh, my God. All right, so we know when not to visit Qatar, for sure. Absolutely. (laughs) Actually, I've been there. I've been to Doha, and I know what it's like. I think I was there in October, and it was a really beautiful time to be there. So usually, MK, I structure these interviews so that we start with what my guest is doing now. But honestly, I think your story of persevering despite the major curveballs that life has thrown you is so relevant and so powerful, especially considering what so many of our listeners and what the world is going through right now with the coronavirus, that I thought I could rewind the film back to when you were a teenager. And I read that in all, you spent about 20 years of your life training to be a professional soccer player. Is that right? Correct. So where did you grow up and where were you hoping to play? Well, I, I, grew up, I grew up here in Qatar. And then when I went to Wisconsin-Madison, so I moved from here to Wisconsin-Madison, Division One team. That was always the dream, just to continue and to probably play for the MLS. But back then, the MLS wasn't that big. So when I graduated, there was this big hole in my life. It's like, oh... So even if I'm that good or maybe I'm not that good, this whole thing of me being that amazing soccer player 
doesn't exist. That was a, that, that was pretty tough. That was pretty tough. So how old were you? And when you say the MLS, what does that stand for? The professional league in, in the U.S. That was my target then. But back then it was very small. Now it's huge. So there would have been more opportunities. Absolutely. When, when I graduated, there, was, there wasn't there. It, the league was so small that it meant nothing. And so you're like, all of a sudden, like your, all your dreams are like, oh, okay. So you're not going to be that professional athlete. And then you graduate as a Muhammad September 11th. Oh, okay. Nobody likes you. Okay. So what, what, what do you do now? What's the plan? Just to kind of fill in some of the blanks here. When you finished soccer, how old were you? When you finished playing and thought about having a professional in career? Time. In, in college, you, I tried you for finished a few in college. professional teams. Yeah, I tried for a few a few professional teams, but when I saw what was out there, it was like it was pretty dark because it was like I'm, you know, as an athlete, you're always thinking like, you know, this is going to be big. There's glamour. There's this. There's that. But when I went out there, even the teams that wanted to sign me up, I was like, wow, there's no one out here. It's, it's pretty quiet. Why is it so quiet? Because back then nobody cared about soccer versus what it is today. Got it. Got it. So you mentioned Madison, Wisconsin, but you transferred, was it to Georgia State? Yeah. But, you see, <laughs> I, I moved from Qatar and they told me that Madison was going to be cold. I'm like, okay, who cares? I, I don't know. It was cold. But I didn't know it was going to be that cold. <laughs> okay. And that was a transition. So you can't move from the desert to snow, you know, but when you're young, you're arrogant, you think you can do that. So it was really hard for me. My, like my whole body, I, I had hives, I had allergies. It was too, I couldn't function as a human being. The NCAA allowed me because of my the, the health to move down to, to Georgia. And that's where, I, that's where I graduated. Yes. You went to Georgia State University and you got a BA in business administration, finance and financial management services. And at the same time you were in school, when did you actually start working in the real estate sector and what were you doing and how did you get that job? I realized that I've always had something for scale. If this thing uh, as an athlete doesn't work, what's big? So what's big? And I'm like, I can see the, all these buildings. It, it's, uh, this is the honest conversation. I'm like, okay, so real estate sounds big, like really big. So why don't I try to do something there? And, then, and that's, that's what attracted me to real estate. And it's a team sport as well. I'm like, okay, so it, it's got all these attributes. Like you have to start from the bottom. You have to work every day. There's wins, there's losses. So that's what attracted me to. So, so I started to start, um, flip homes. I, I say, I'd say my junior year, I started to flip homes. I made no money. I lost so much money. After I graduated, I met up with Gerald Blonder, who was the, at the time called the Godfather of Apartments in Atlanta. And this is, this is what's so cool about the story is, is that I met him after I had literally given up. So here's a Muhammad in the U.S. giving up because nobody wants to talk to him after September 11th to be actually mentored by a very prominent Jewish developer in Atlanta. And I was like, that, that was just so cool. And uh, I was with him for years. Like he was my mentor, not just in business, business in life for like, I'd say seven years. He, he kind of shaped my life during that period. And how did you meet him? Internship. It was an internship. And how did you get the internship? I forced my way through. I was like at the brink. I'm like, you, you, you can't give up. And I heard so much about him. And I'm like, you know what? Thinking as an athlete, this is the win. This, this, this is a win. So if you go in as a Muhammad to meet Gerald and get Gerald to sign you today as an intern, that's kind of cool. So that, that's what I went for. So I went in, I did the full, you know, the, the, the best sales pitch I've ever done 
in any project or any business was to convince him to take me under his wings. So did you set up an appointment or did you just like show up one day? I showed up one day. No, I showed up many days. I showed up many, many, many days. Now remember, this is this is Atlanta. So a Muhammad showing up every day was like kind of weird. I was like, what? Why is he there? So he eventually saw me. I had to go through his son first and his son was very, very aggressive. Kind of kicked me out of his office. I'm, not gonna, I'm still going to come back tomorrow. Because I, I believed so- in that whole dream kind of thing. So how many times did you go back to the office before you actually Seven. connected? Seven. 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 I, I'll never and forget. And were you it. just Seven. like waiting? I'm sorry. Were you waiting to run into him? Is that what you were doing? That's what I was trying to do. Because I, I had nothing better to do. So I'd sit there the whole day. And the, the whole day? Was, oh, yeah, yeah. I had nothing to do. You know, that, that's what I'm saying. Like, I'm thinking like an athlete. So I'm like... This is training. Sit. If he shows up, he shows up. If he doesn't show up, it's not really a, a loss. Not yet. We'll come back tomorrow. And so you finally got in the room with him. And yes. what did you say? I said to him, here's the situation. I thought I was going to be this soccer player. I graduated as Muhammad. No one wants to talk to me. I'm not really after money. But I think I like real estate, and I'm not sure why. Why don't you just try me? That's exactly what I said. He sat down, he's like, try you in what? I'm like, I don't really care in anything. And that, 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 it, it, that's exactly how it happened. And, and he said, yeah, sure. Come back tomorrow. And what happened then? Then we started. Then, then I worked. I started also consulting at that time. He helped me get to to this job in consulting. So he's like, I'll help you. I'll become your mentor. You don't have to tell anyone that I'm your mentor. You don't have to intern over here. The best thing for you to do is to go work for this person. Go work for this person because I know this person. And in the meantime, you will get access to me all the time because you're working for this person. And this is how I'm going to mentor you. And that's how the relationship started. And for years and years and years, I was like, I, I, I get to see him every single day. Look, there, there was a time, I, I always say this, like there was a time that I would actually take his charitable, the charity con- uh, contribution checks to the synagogues. And back then we just worked on checks. So it was, it was so cool to drive up to a synagogue as a Muhammad post 9-11 and say, hey, here's your check. Have a good day. It was, it was just so human. There's something so human about that uh, that, that I really enjoyed. Your bio says that in 2002, you started working in low-income housing projects before you became a managing partner in one of the leading, was it real estate consulting practices in, in yeah, Atlanta? It was, a, it was a tax. It was a tax real estate consulting business, correct. I was fortunate enough, again, when I met with the, the lower-income housing tax credits, I was working with two developers, basically, or, or three that are now that are huge, and I got to see the value of real estate through them. So we would go into these cities that are completely just torn down, and the idea was very simple: if you go in, rebuild this section of the city, you're going to get a tax break. That's just the simple, the simple law. And I would watch the whole project. I was like, wow, we just built a city for all those people. That is so cool. That's, that's when I really fell in love with real estate. When you can see what real estate does to people's lives. From then on, all the way up until 2012, that, that, that's all I worked on. MK, do you have any advice for our young listeners as to how they should seek out and cultivate a mentor or mentors in their lives. You just got to keep trying. Like, you know, we're today, we give up too fast on anything. We, we call it a pivot. We call it this or that, but no one wants to put in the real effort. You know, as you sit there every day for seven days a week, not knowing what the outcome is. If you know what you want, 
for now, if you know who you want to talk to as your mentor for now, then just go sit out there. Just go sit out for, for hours. So what if you get rejected? Who cares? Today, rejection is so overrated. We talk about it like, what? I'm not going to sit there and wait. No, you are going to sit there and wait if you care that much. But what if he doesn't st- talk to me, if he didn't see me? Who cares? It's what you want to do. No one, no one told you to go with it. It's what you want to do. So it's just a lot of self-awareness, a lot of honesty about yourself. And then just go out there and do it. Fight for it. It sounds like you did research into who you wanted to become your mentor. Is that like the first step that they should take is to find out sort of who the best in whatever that industry might be is you know, and then so seek the them best. out? You know, it's not so much about the best. What you should do is if you figure out, if you sit by yourself and be honest about who you are and what do you want from that mentor or that internship or that company? And once you find that person that you, he or she, that you are attracted to, then go to them and never give up. That, that's the thing. See, again, today, today, it goes back to that, like, but I'm not going to go sit there. I don't know what I should do. No, you do know what you should do. You know, today it's just, it's just different. Like you should, to seek out a mentor, a mentor is a very big thing in your life. But you have to figure out what type of mentor you want. Not a book, not your parents, not your friends, not your girlfriend. You have to figure out what, what's that gap that you have that he can fulfill for you. And if you fall in love with that one mentor, man, just go fight for it. I love this advice. And I'll tell you why, because this really does touch on what you were sharing in our Espresso Shots episode. And check out show notes to see if Mohammed's Espresso Shots episode has already dropped. But you were talking about the importance, one of the most important qualities that you look for in young people is their grit. And the fact that you said like the best, some of the best advice that you could give young people today is to find ways to fail a lot now. And I was like, what? Find ways to fail. But think about it. If somebody who's influential has a young person who is showing up in their office every single day, waiting all day long to meet with you, despite the fact that the receptionist is saying, I'm sorry, he's, you know, he or she is not coming in today. There's no openings on their schedule. And you're like, that's okay. I'll just wait right here. That's fine. And you bring your sandwich or whatever it is. and You just sit there. Now, granted, it's the coronavirus. So (laughs) not so easy, but we're talking about post coronavirus. Let's, let's be realistic here. And you Find out from your receptionist, because trust me, they're going to say there's this kid that like has been here for the last eight days saying that they just want 10 minutes of your time and they w- they're here all day. You're going to be curious. You're going to want to meet this person because we are looking for young people who are hardworking, who are dedicated, who are going to bust their butt and who have grit. Exactly. You know, you know what it is, is that these attributes are so, so important. No one is going to go out there with a solution, whether you have a network or whether you're privileged or underprivileged, no one knows what tomorrow is. You know, it seems like we are, you know, today we're like, can I do this to guarantee that? That's not how life works. No, you can't do that to guarantee that. You can do that, but... If you get an L, who cares? Go for the next one. We're so much more fragile today when we talk about that. So what? If you lose, so what? Win on the next one. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. Okay, now let's talk about what you're doing in your current job in the Middle East as the general manager of operations at one of the leading construction contracting groups in the Middle East. What does that mean to be the general manager of operations? 
I just run everything. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, you know, outside of the construction, the actual construction. So outside of Bob the Builder, I run the company everything. So I control the finances of the company, the costing of the, uh, the projects, everything other than just the actual construction activities. And this project that I'm on is about $1.5 billion. And it's not because I'm special. It's not because I'm good. I'm very, 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 very average. It's just about putting yourself at the, you know, the right space and doing the right thing and saying the right things, always doing what's right. It's just good fortune. So yeah, I looked for that opportunity and it, it kind of fulfilled that hole that I had with being an athlete. You know, cause when you, when you don't think you're going to become that professional athlete, it's, there's this huge void and I'm sure millions of people can relate to that. And then you just, I continue to live my life as an athlete. And so I position myself, okay, this is one game. And so the, my job every day is like, we run, we spend about 10 to $15 million a month. This project is going to be biggest theme parks underground in, in the whole region. It's just huge. It's $1.5 billion. And, and again, I would have never thought I would ever do this. But if you're a practical dreamer and you put yourself in the right position, it will happen. Well, you were saying in the Espresso Shots episode, your advice to young people who are graduating from college is to, unless your passion happens to overlap with your strength, with something that you're amazing at, where, that you do incredibly well, that comes easily to you. Let's just say that. Mm -hmm. That comes easily to you. You should lean into your strengths. Absolutely. Kind of put your passion on pause, lean into your strengths. So that's what you did. Exactly. Exactly. See, I thought I was a very good soccer player. I wasn't. I thought I was very talented. I wasn't. I thought I was going to be very special. I wasn't. But it's like, and I don't know what drove me to think that. It could be family. It could be that I played for Division One schools. But once you realize that, you've got a choice to make. You have to make that pivot. I'm like, okay, but failure is not an option. So what am I good at? Oh, I'm good at this? Let me perfect this. Let me go find them. Who's the best mentor at this? Oh, he's that. I'm going to, I'm going to learn from him. And I just kept perfecting that to be in the position I'm in today. So if you had given me an option back then, would you rather be the professional soccer player or real estate? Of course, I would have said the professional soccer player. Of course, I would have said the fans and the star and that. Oh, of course, I would have said that. But today I say no. Today I would say no. I would rather do what, this route because I'm like, I'm really good at what I do. And hopefully somehow I can still find a way back to soccer. Doing what exactly? Is it? Not necessarily as an athlete, but that's my passion. So I'll go back to it. Do you play it in some of your free time? Oh, do you have yeah. pickup games? Oh, yeah. Very competitive. Yeah. Very, very competitive. Fantastic. Yeah. So take us into what you do in a typical day. And I'm guessing there is no typical day, but just take us into what are you doing first thing in the morning and how does your day unfold and, and what are all the things that you're juggling? By 7.30 in the morning, I get, I get my reports on all the projects. So I get the reports on what needs to be done for the week and what is planned for the month. And when I say that, I'm talking about what actual activities. So what needs to be purchased, what needs to be built, what needs to be, how many laborers out there. And then I said, I have to approve what budgets go against that. So for, for example, today I got my first report at 730 is like, we have to install 140 elevators in one of the sites because the elevators are there. Do we have a green light to do it or not? That conversation ended at eight. I got the report at 730 at eight. I called the project manager. I'm like, are we ready to install the elevators? They said, yes. I'm like, is the client happy? They're like, yes. I'm like, okay, start mobilizing. I'll send the funds. Let's just do it. And then that went from like eight. They started, and it's, it's, it's a four day process. So that, that's my day basically is spent on planning and executing basis on the finances. 
Got it. So are you a really good, like super detail oriented person? Is this one of your superpowers? No, no, no. I'm I'm a very average, generous person, but I know how to hire. I know how to fire. I know whom to trust and whom not to trust. I'm a people's person. I put all my effort in HR. All my effort are in the people. That's the most important thing to me. The team, the team, the team. That's what I always focus on. Since I'm very average, I'm like, I'm, I'm very aware, I'm very average. And, and I, I get people around me that make me a superstar. And I ask them to make me a superstar. I think you're also very humble. <laughs> so, MK, as you heard me say at the beginning of this interview, I think in a kind of a loose way, that huge curveball you were thrown in September 2001 as part of the fallout in the United States in the wake of the 9-11 attacks was for you not dissimilar to the same kind of shocking curveball that all of us experienced all around the world with the spread of the coronavirus. And, And as a caveat, by no means am I suggesting that what you experienced was on par with all those who lost their lives in the Twin Towers or the first responders who was trying to rescue all those in the Twin Towers. But as a young Muslim who had just graduated from college, simply because of your name, you were suddenly persona non grata. So what advice do you have for our young listeners who may have graduated in May 2020 or will be graduating at the in the spring of 2021 as to the lessons that you may have taken away with you from your personal professional challenge in the wake of 9-11 to help those struggling now in the wake of the coronavirus fallout? This is not the end. It may seem like it's the end. It may seem like a very bad part of your life, but tomorrow may be worse. So you got to look at things in perspective of time. So when I went to the first recession, the dot com recession is like, this is the end. It wasn't the end. Then it was 0809. Is this the end? Yes, it's the end. Everything, we're all, we're all going to go to, no, no it's, it's never the end. It's all time relevant. And so you got to train yourself, just block the negativity. This all passes. It's, it's very time relevant. So you got to build that perseverance inside you. You have to have that mindset. You can sit and watch as many motivational videos on YouTube as, as you want. If you're not going to do anything about it, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You've got to have that mindset. That yes, this is tough. Got to acknowledge this. It's really tough and it's really weird and no one knows what the formula of success out of this is. But it's never the end. So there's definitely coming a tomorrow. Just prep yourself for that tomorrow. And, and don't ask for results too soon. So what I did, I always blocked out negativity. Whether it's people, the news, politics, whatever, whatever it is. Whatever is negative, just block it out. And I'm not saying to you... Be positive in the clouds and not acknowledge what's happening. No, just be practical. Yeah, yeah, sure, it's tough. But this toughness builds resilience. So I say, if you're graduating right now, there are industries that are going to go away. But guess what? There are opportunities that are going to be built that we've never thought of. We never, ever dreamed that we can have billion-dollar meetings on Zoom. That, 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 That wasn't even an option. Like we had to meet and agree. So everything has changed. So I say, figure out what's going to last just on a human level. Are we still going to have meetings? What industries are going to still be there? And position yourself to be there. Don't bank on just a simple degree that you got and think that was your ticket out. Yeah. Now you got to pivot. Now you got to change. Maybe you got to learn a new skill. Who cares? But there are so many opportunities that are going to come out of this pandemic. If you see them as opportunities, if you're waiting for the insurance policy through your degree, yeah, you're going to have a hard time, a very hard time. What I honestly mean is this, is that if you thought your degree was an insurance policy, you're wrong. And if you think it's the end of the world, you're wrong. So with every recession, pandemic, whatever, there's so many opportunities created. If you are willing to view them as opportunities. Position yourself 
to view them as an opportunity. Because otherwise, you just fail. So, yeah, sure, you've worked so hard for this degree and you wanted to work for this industry. If that industry doesn't exist, who cares? Just move on. If it means that you have to get one more set of technical skills or knowledge, just go get it. But there's a gazillion opportunities that are going to come out right now. And what I mean by that is, who ever thought that we are now running billion-dollar companies via Zoom? You know, when we had to be in meetings and dress in suits. So it's a different world. You should capitalize on that world because that world actually belongs to you, not to me. It's weird to me. You don't have to adjust. You just need to learn. There's a big difference between that. So I, I say be optimistic, but be a practical optimist. Acknowledge that it's hard out there. I'm not saying it's not hard. It's going to be very hard. Pivot a million times so you get it right. Block out the negativity. And understand that we're still going to be here. The planet is still here. If you make it out of this safe, that's an awesome opportunity for you to be the best you can be. Because a lot didn't. And so if you've given that privilege or that opportunity, go for it. Love it so much. I remember, MK, I am not like you, a gifted athlete. And even if you think you were not a good soccer player. You were good enough that you made to division one. So I am more like run of the mill. Like I'm like that plow horse. Like I'm just determined and I just keep plodding away. I remember when I was 20 years old, maybe I was 20. No, no, no. I, w I was 20. Excuse me. I was 19 and I ran a marathon with my dad. And I remember he and I were training and as we were coming up to a hill, he said to me, Andrea, this is like life. You're running, you're doing your thing, and you suddenly it's really hard. And you've got to like dig deep to get up to the top of that hill or the top of that mountain. And then you get up there and it's like, oh, my God, this feels so good. I'm not running up right. and it's maybe it's flat. Maybe you have a downhill. And it's really easy, but there's going to be another hill. Absolutely. And so exactly to Muhammad's point, if you can look at this coronavirus, yes, it's there's some definite downsides, but it's a hill. You got to put your head down. You got to get to the top of it and then you're going to hit a flat or you may hit a downhill. Then it's going to be easy. But. It's going to be hard again at some point. So just adopt that mindset and you're going to be good. And Mohammed, I want to ask you a question that I try to ask all of my guests. And that is to share a time in your professional life when you really struggled. Maybe not at the beginning. You mentioned the 2008-2009 recession. A time when you may have fallen flat on your face, but most important here is the story of resilience, of how you got through that tough time. And if there was a lesson that you learned in the process. In 2008 and 2009, that was a really, really tough recession for anyone who worked in real estate, not, not just a recession. I had to go through that at a very young age. And I also had my, my daughter was diagnosed with cancer at the time. So I had foreclosures, bankruptcy notices and everything. And, and the mindset was like, what do I do? So quitting is not an option. And winning is not visible. What do you actually do? You just actually truly fight. So no cliche, no YouTube motivational videos. It's like, you just need to get out of this. Because if you get out of this, regardless of what tomorrow is, it's definitely better than this. So I just fought through it. And that's the mindset I've had. I'm like, this was so dark. This was so, at a time where I was arrogant, I had a lot of money and then I lost all the money. I was so young. And then to have the daughter situation, it was like, wow. And a phone call from my wife telling me about my daughter. I was like, lights out. And that's just life. So you can put up all the insurance policies. You can save all the money. You can do whatever you want to do. But when life decides to turn against you, for whatever reason it may be. You just need to train yourself. It's like, oh, this is coming. Okay, I'm ready. Let's play. And surround yourself with the right people that want to help you. 
during those times. And train yourself, train your mindset, train yourself physically, mentally, spiritually, all that stuff for that time when it happens. So th there's so many mountains. We can sit and talk about it today, just about the pandemic. Pandemic is just a flu, but the flu is killing people. You can sit and try to figure out what does that actually mean? Who cares? If you make it out of there safe, just go be big. Just go do great. At least try. So powerful, Mohammed. Final T for C question. If you could go back to college, back to Georgia State, and do it all over again, but based on the immense wisdom you have now, what advice would you give yourself? Be happy. Enjoy a lot more. It, it, it's, it's not, it's not what, it, what they tell you it is. There's, there isn't a roadmap. There isn't a guaranteed insurance policy that if you put, if you did this, this happens. And it's a very nice place to be where you can, it's a different world in its own being in a college, in a campus. You should enjoy it a lot more and just do what's right. I used to stress so much. I'm like, what am I going to do when I graduate? What am I going to do with this? Should I do this or should I do that? And I'm like, when I graduated, I did nothing. I did nothing of what I thought I was going to do. So this part of your career or your life is not the pivotal point that they're telling you it's going to be. It's just a stepping stone or it may mean nothing given this pandemic. So for now, just enjoy it and be happy and do what's right. When I say enjoy and be happy, I'm not, I'm not saying go out and party and be an idiot. I'm saying just enjoy everything, every part of it. You're going to miss that dorm room. You're going to miss that test. You're going to miss sitting next to people. You're going to miss that. You're going to miss that. Now you can't even do that. And so I, I'd say if, you, if you're just enjoy it, just enjoy it and, be, and just do what's right. Live in the moment. Yeah. That's what we all should be doing, no matter what yeah. age we are, Absolutely. for sure. MK, I want to thank you so much for making so much time for coffee today with me and the T4C community. Your philosophy, your message is just so unbelievably powerful. I hope our listeners really breathe it in. Just take it in, sit with it, and adopt this growth mindset that you are going to do I promise you, you are going to have an incredible life, a fulfilled, fulfilling, meaningful life. If you listen to the words that Mohammed just shared with us, thank you so much. It has been such a pleasure. Thanks for having me. I hope this means a lot to your listeners, too. Thanks so much for listening to Time for Coffee, where the professionals in the jobs that most interest you always have time to grab coffee 24-7, no matter where you live. I have one quick favor to ask you. Remember to rate, review, and subscribe to Time for Coffee. Thanks so much.